The Role of a Patient-Centered Advisory Council in Defining Healthcare Quality, a Dissertation Defense by Jimmy Parks. Here at UAMS, Chancellor Ron has instituted the Patient and Family-Centered Care Initiative. It is explicitly meant to move our organizational culture towards patient-centeredness for the sake of improving quality. As part of that initiative, clinical departments are creating advisory councils that include patients and families as members. My project is a critical analysis of the story of one of those patient and family advisory councils. Their story is about the concept of quality, how the concept of quality is used in communities to get things done, and how the concept of quality is used in health systems to get things done. And most importantly, how these two approaches to quality come together in an advisory council process at UAMS. With this project, I wanted to describe a patient-centered advisory council in the terms of its participants. I wanted to demonstrate a non-traditional approach to public health leadership. I wanted to apply a model of dynamic quality to the advisory council process in a way that would generate recommendations for councils at UAMS and elsewhere, and that would have implications for healthcare and leadership more broadly. So this is the outline I'll use. I'll start with a summary of the literature review, then I'll describe a model of dynamic quality. I'll describe the research methodology. Then I'll talk a little more about the data analysis and results around four themes that emerged in this process. Purpose, decision making, organizational structure, and communication. Then we'll talk about the implications and recommendations of this study. There were over 700 articles in my Zotera reference manager, which means I read more than 700 abstracts for this project. More than 180 articles made the cut for the final dissertation's bibliography. So I'm going to try to summarize all that very briefly, starting with the literature on patient-centered care. There are four major issues in most of that literature. First, the overarching reason for patient-centered care is to improve the quality of health care. Secondly, to improve quality, patients must play a greater role in and take greater responsibility for the decisions made about their own health. Third, the relationship between patients and their providers must improve if quality is to improve. And finally, patient-centeredness is about organizational change, system change, and culture change. That is, improving quality through patient-centeredness requires more than incremental changes, it requires a paradigm shift. An advisory council, or advisory boards, can take many forms and their specific roles can vary. But councils that include patients as members are an increasingly common component of patient-centered care and are meant to address all of these issues. Martin and others in the chronic illness literature have concluded that traditional evidence-based clinical models are inadequate for addressing the complexity and idiosyncratic nature of chronic illness. There is a call in this literature for quality improvement by increasing the patient's influence on decision-making and by improving the relationship between the patient and their providers. The increasing prevalence of chronic illness has been a major impetus for the move towards patient-centered care. Health literacy was originally characterized as a patient deficiency, where patients were diagnosed as not skilled enough or educated enough to navigate the demands of the system. More recent literature refers to health literacy as more of a shared problem, so that providers, too, need to improve their skills if their information cannot be easily understood by patients. The health literacy literature calls for quality improvement by increasing the patient's ability to make health-related decisions and by improving the communication between the patient and their providers. Health literacy education and training for patients and providers is now a major component of most efforts to move towards patient-centered care. The literature from other sciences, like organizational communication and behavior, philosophy, physics, economics, and leadership, was also important to understanding the components of patient-centered care. To save time, I'll talk more about this literature when I describe the analytical model. Since quality is one of the most important concepts in health, and since quality improvement is central to the move to patient-centered care, let's review the literature on the concept of quality as it's used in healthcare. The literature suggests there are two fundamental facets of quality, static and dynamic. Static quality is value assessed using a predefined standard. The static quality of something is determined using categories or numbers that have already been assigned value. Common tools of objective static quality are performance standards or health indicators. 
The literature says these static quality metrics dominate the way healthcare quality is assessed. Dynamic quality, on the other hand, cannot be defined or measured because it is precognitive. That is, it happens before it can be defined, and it happens in the interaction of a person with their environment in a particular space in a particular time. It has been referred to as intuition, feelings, and subjectivity. You've heard people talk about dynamic quality when they talk about art, beauty, vulgarity, etc. They'll say, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Patient-centered care is about giving the subjectivity of patients more influence in healthcare. The quality and patient-centered care literature suggests that the overall quality of healthcare will improve when the patient's sense of dynamic quality or subjectivity is given more influence in healthcare and that patient-centeredness is a way to get that done. Missing from all this literature is a practice-based and community-based public health perspective on the concept of quality, where people are not conceptualized as patients, but as members of their local community who are trying to do something about some aspect of health. To demonstrate a scientific way to address that gap, I'm going to describe a model of dynamic quality based on McKnight's model of community-based public health, and then use that model to analyze the data from this advisory council. In this model, dynamic quality happens here in the interactive engagement of a unique individual with their unique local environment, represented here by the blue oval. This is what I refer to as the level of dynamic quality. This local context is where individual behaviors, social determinants, and environmental factors of health play out. And since people's experience, values, and environment is always changing, dynamic quality is always subject to change. Static quality is created here in the dialogue between two or more people. So these two people have dialogue, drawing on their personal subjective sense of dynamic quality to create objective tools here. Examples of these objective tools are words, numbers, definitions, formulas, models, rules, standards, and so on. It's also important that since static quality tools are created in dialogue, they can only be changed in dialogue. So even though I'm referring to this knowledge as static, these words and tools can change as these two people continue to have dialogue about their experience of a changing environment and about their own changing values. Changing the words and tools we use is a critical way that groups adapt to their changing environment. I've added a few more people to this picture here. This will represent a local community where dynamic and static quality come together to create a local knowledge at a particular place. To summarize, a major assumption of this model is that dynamic quality is essential to the process of creating knowledge that is useful in the local context. According to McKnight, a system is designed to control and produce standardized practices and outcomes. People who work in a system specialize in certain aspects of reality or knowledge out of its local context, and they're called subject matter experts, professionals, etc. They use existing knowledge to construct fixed values and objective tools. They create generalizable knowledge, theories, formulas, measures, and static quality standards. This current professional knowledge is a set of static quality standards created by experts based on the predefined values and assumptions of the organizational culture, but without direct access to the process of dynamic quality that only happens here. So this model will be used to examine how these two ways of defining quality or creating knowledge came together in this advisory council process. Before I talk about the rest of the assumptions of this model, we need to discuss what sets this model apart from the other theoretical models about how this relationship works. Trethway says the creativity of individuals and the constraints of an organizational culture are balanced through communication between individuals and organizations. Gostin says that public health is achieved by balancing individual freedom with a system of public health law. In the patient-centered care literature, 
This is the partnership model where the expert and the patient bring their respective knowledge together as equal partners. These influential scientists are saying that systems are essential because they balance out the dynamic aspects of humanity seen here on the left. McKnight's model is subtly but importantly different. He agrees that there is a tension between these sets of ideas and that using the power of one takes power from the other. But instead of calling this a process of finding a healthy balance, he suggests that freely associating people and communities at the level of dynamic quality are essential to public health, but that no particular system, tool, ball, or standard is essential. Based on McKnight's work, it is a major assumption of this model that public health emerges when most of the work related to health is done in and by communities, and that the weakening of the health of communities is the direct result of the increasing power of the health system. So that's the literature and theoretical part of the project. Now let's talk about what I did. The setting for this project is a patient and family centered advisory council for UAMS's Internal Medicine North Outpatient Clinic. Participants were the council members and any UAMS employees that had an influence on this process. The data are the actions, decisions, and comments of these participants. We used a practice-based research model where knowledge is considered a local and contingent process and where understanding comes from participation in that process. We used ethnography meant to capture the culture of a group and interpretive phenomenology to describe the lived experience or what it's like to be a part of that group's culture. Participant observation was the main way I collected data for the project. I spent almost two years with the Patient Advisory Council and took over 2,000 field notes. I attended more than 18 council meetings, 35 liaison meetings, that is, facilitator meetings, and a lot of other meetings related to patient-centeredness at UAMS. I audio-video recorded many of the meetings I attended, and I used keywords and time marks to make the notes more useful. I collected and reviewed documents, emails, and handouts, and made notes about how these artifacts came to the council process and how they influenced it. I conducted and took notes on at least 45 semi-structured interviews, most of which were recorded. I also took notes on a lot of informal interviews related to the council process, some of which were not audio or video recorded. I attended and recorded meetings, created clips for our conference, helped facilitate and expedite council recommendations, gathered information for the council, participated in liaison meetings, gave rides to the meetings, and helped write a white paper about the project. These were some of the activities that defined my role in the council process. Over the course of the project, themes emerged. These themes were grounded in the actions, decisions, and comments of the participants. But as the interpreter, I had to make decisions about how to organize and present the data. I used a process called member checking, where I continually returned to the participants to verify or clarify the data and the themes, to help organize the data, and to get advice for how to present the data. Here's an example of an early list of potential themes. We refined the list over time based on interviews and the activities of the members. Here's one of the last versions of the list of themes, which is very much like the one we're using today. In early 2011, the Internal Medicine North Clinic was trying to be formally recognized as a patient-centered medical home. To complement that effort, they created a community and patient advisory board with three community members and three patients. In their first meetings, they had a conversation around the broad question, why participate? And they made a list of things they wanted to do. The theme drawn from this early part of the story is purpose. What was the purpose of the council? What were they trying to do? Within the first few months, council members began making recommendations for changes to be made in the clinic. Some of those changes were made, some were not. Decisions were also made about the council. All of these decisions and the way they were made led to the second theme, decision-making. What changes and decisions were made, how were they made, and what was the influence of the council in the decision-making process? During this two-year period, several personnel and organizational changes occurred in the clinic and to the council. The clinic's medical director, nursing director, and others who had built relationships with the council members left UAMS. The council's facilitators changed. The administrative authority for the council changed. These and other changes affected the council's connection to the clinic and to UAMS. The theme drawn from this part of the story is organizational structure. 
how did the organizational structure affect the relationship between the council and UAMX? What barriers and opportunities did it present? Almost two years after the council began, it came under the authority of the Chancellor's new Patient and Family Centered Care Initiative, which changed the way the council operated and the way the council was connected to UAMX. These personnel and organizational changes had effects on conversations in the council meetings and on communication between the council and UAMX. The theme drawn from this last part of the story then was communication. What were the expectations about how people are to communicate in the council process and how was dialogue created or constrained in the council process? Now we'll discuss the findings in more detail and in terms of the analytical model. Now let's talk about how the model of dynamic quality described earlier was applied to the data collected. So recall two major assumptions of the model, that public health results when communities solve their health-related problems locally and with the least amount of system power possible, and that dialogue between people and communities and people in the health system is essential to changing the organizational culture of the system. So within each theme, the comments, actions, and decisions of the advisory council participants are considered using these two questions. Does this move the influence of the decision-making process closer to or away from the level of dynamic quality? And does this constrain or create dialogue in the council process? So for each theme, I'll present a couple of slides that list the data in this format. For the group of data on each slide, I'll talk about how they affect or reflect decision-making and communication in the council process and use these big yellow arrows to illustrate whether they move the process toward or away from dialogue and the level of dynamic quality. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. I'll discuss a couple of data points from each theme in detail, but just mention the others. This presentation is just meant to give you a sense for the kind of data that were collected and how they were interpreted. More examples, more context, and alternative interpretations are in the paper, and we can talk more about them after this presentation. We'll start with theme one, purpose. There was a general consensus among all participants that the council process was to make UAMS better. But we have to look at more specific data to understand what that means. For now, I'm going to focus on the first three bullets here. Initially, the council set out to do two things. First, they wanted to change the current health system paradigm. Data from their meeting minutes indicate that they wanted to move the power and responsibility for making decisions in healthcare towards patients. The UAMS employees who attended these first meetings asked the council members to hold them responsible for pushing the council's recommendations up the chain and to jump chain if necessary. They said they felt it was their job not just to report the council's recommendations to decision makers, but was to advocate for those recommendations. These are explicit expectations that the council will move the decision making process closer to the level of dynamic quality. Secondly, they wanted to change the relationship between patients and employees. Council members said patients need to have more voice in those relationships and more influence over decisions that were made in that interaction. They said doctors have good information and they care about their patients, but that there were barriers to developing relationships with them, including short visits, rotating schedules, and the fact that patients were prejudged. These were issues the council intended to address. These were explicit expectations that the council would move the decision-making process closer to the level of dynamic quality and that they would increase dialogue and re improve relationship building. Those were some of the expectations of the council members in the first few meetings. Over time, leadership and organizational structure changed around the council, and so did the expectations and orientation of the group. About a year after the council formed, they were given an advisory council handbook, which included a set of predefined goals and roles for the council members. Among other things, the handbook said part of the council's role was to participate in decision making and to improve the relationship between patients and staff. These were very similar to what the council had come up with already. They were expectations that the council will move the decision making process closer to the level of dynamic quality. However, Predefining the council's roles and responsibilities constrains the council's dialogue about the purpose and mission of the council. The conversations about the purpose of the council changed as well. Statements about the purpose of the council began to include statements from employees like, the council is not a place to air our dirty laundry, and we do not want people on the council who have an agenda. These are expectations that dialogue in the council meetings would be constrained. From the perspective of UAMS, advisory councils are a standard piece of a patient-centered care organization. 
so it may seem efficient to predefine parameters for that group, even the purpose of the group, based on predefined organizational goals, especially if evidence suggests that the council would have arrived at similar goals anyway. But asking them to live up to principles and role expectations that were established out of context reduces the capacity to define their own group, to define what is a problem, and to create solutions to problems. This implies that patient-centeredness is conceptualized as a goal of the organization rather than as a process of engaging patients in dialogue and relationship building. In summary, improving quality meant system change to some participants and national recognition to others. And patient-centered care was more often characterized as an objective of the organization than as a new way of doing things. Both of these issues call for more dialogue between people and their health care workers. Now on to theme two, decision making. In this presentation, I'll just talk about these first two bullets of data. Soon after their first meeting, the council members were given completed satisfaction surveys. They took them home, studied them, and came up with a set of recommendations for improving clinic operations. By using patient feedback to decide what was a problem, and by defining solutions to those problems in the advisory council, they were moving the decision-making process closer to the level of dynamic quality. It was up to UAMS employees to carry out the solutions suggested by the council, and this complicated the assessment of whether or not the decision-making process was moved closer to the level of dynamic quality. To get at that, we have to consider data from meeting minutes and interviews about the council's influence on decisions that were made. The medical director said she carried a copy of the council's recommendations with her to administrative meetings. Other employees told council members they were working on problems addressed by the council's recommendations. They said patient feedback was important, and they said they were grateful to the council for their recommendations. Beyond that, though, it was hard to ascertain the influence of the council. For example, employees said some changes they were making in the clinic were going to be made anyway. Some clinic decision makers said they didn't know what the council had done. Council members themselves said, it's not always clear what happens to the recommendations we make once they leave the group. The influence of those recommendations wasn't easy for me to follow either. It's not easy for employees to talk to a researcher about power and the decision-making process of their organization, and it's not easy to ask those critical questions. So it's hard to say whether the decision-making process was moved towards the level of dynamic quality or not. Besides the decisions that were made about clinic operations, there were also decisions made about the council itself. Early on, the council was very informal. Members were involved in decisions about membership, and there were no bylaws. In this sense, the council was self-defined, which moves the decision-making process closer to the level of dynamic quality. A series of decisions made later about the council's name, location, composition, and facilitation were made with little council involvement and were all made by UAMS employees to meet UAMS standards or goals, and those decisions were not announced to the council by the person who made the final decision. Defining the council using organizational standards does not move the decision-making process closer to the level of dynamic quality. So the council was given some role in decision-making, but it was hard to tell what that role was, and the council members wanted to know what happened to their decisions. They wanted to know that what they were doing made a difference, these are areas that call for more dialogue and transparency. To understand the organization's decision-making process, the council had to understand the organizational structure that frames that process. That became the third theme, and it grew out of the council's concern that patients don't understand how UAMS works. They also felt that they could make more useful recommendations if they understood how the clinic operates. They didn't want to waste their time making recommendations that they knew couldn't work. In the first few years of the council, the medical director was their main connection to the clinic. Soon, both the nursing director and medical director of the clinic left. When they left, that connection shifted from the medical arm to the administrative arm of the organizational structure. Both arms lead ultimately to the chancellor, but through different channels. Just a few months later, the council was brought under the new Patient and Family Centered Care Initiative, which created another chain of authority from the council to the chancellor. These changes complicated attempts to understand how the council was related to the clinic and to UAMS, but also offered opportunities for conversations about that structure. The council's place in the organizational structure can be defined to some extent by who attends its meetings. Some UAMS employees were invited by the council when they had questions about the employee's area of responsibility or expertise. Creating a new line of authority for the Patient and Family Centered Care Initiative 
offered an opportunity for council members to jump chain. In this sense, council members were able to define their group and perhaps their place in the organization, which moves the decision-making process towards the level of dynamic quality. Other employees were appointed by their manager or administrator and were given specific roles in the council. The council members did not have a voice in choosing these employees or the council facilitators. In this sense, the council was not able to define their group, which does not move the decision-making process towards the level of dynamic quality. The council was not involved in creating the new membership requirements. This is an example of how the council was defined by organizational standards and to meet organizational goals, which does not move the decision-making process towards the level of dynamic quality. One change to the membership criteria was that at-large community members were not to be members of patient and family advisory councils. By excluding community members from the advisory council, the organization is drawing a line that suggests the value of their service is to be determined within the context of the healthcare organization rather than in the local context of the person being served. This does not move decision-making process closer to the level of dynamic quality and excluding community members from the council constrains dialogue. Throughout the changes to the council's connection to UAMS, participants maintained there were two important factors about the employee who connected them to UAMS. First, the nature of their interpersonal relationships with council members and other employees. And second, the degree to which they were into it, that is, their personal definition of and enthusiasm for patient-centeredness and their stake in the status quo. So it was the in interpersonal relationships to these individuals and their personal interpretations of patient-centeredness which determined whether or not the changes to the organizational culture moved the decision-making process closer to the level of dynamic quality. This council offered the opportunity to create new relationships across disciplines, but there was a tendency to stick to existing organizational structures. Council members wanted to be connected to decision makers, but the personal characteristics of their connections mattered more. The barriers to better relationships and reorganization that have been identified here call for dialogue and liberating structures. With all this talk about dialogue, communication has to be a theme, and so it is. Theme 4. Participants were in general agreement that relationship building and physical presence were important parts of the council process. There were some opportunities for socializing before and after the meetings, and some interactions outside the group led to new and stronger relationships between council participants. So the advisory council meetings provided an opportunity for dialogue and relationship building. Communication in this council was shaped by two assumptions made by participants that led to one major barrier to dialogue. The first assumption held by participants was that subjectivity obscures facts, that the goal of hearing a patient is to glean data that can improve the way health care is administered. Examples are when administrators say it's all about the data or we must have data. This is the idea that communication is a transaction which sets up members of the council to strip data from the context of the patient's emotions and worldviews to meet the organizational goals or the goals of the meeting. This constrains dialogue, and it does not move the decision-making process towards the level of dynamic quality. The second assumption held by participants was that UAMS employees operate objectively. Some employees said, if we cannot show real data to doctors and administrators, then nothing will change. The idea was that people who make decisions for UAMS do so based on facts and objective standards, not based on emotions or opinions. However, Many of the decisions about the council were based on personal preference, convenience, misconceptions, or subjective interpretations of guidelines. Nevertheless, employees were expected to behave towards the council as if they were objective, not emotional, and this constrains dialogue in the council meetings. These two notions influenced the orientation of the council meetings away from the level of dynamic quality in specific ways. Patients were excluded as members if they were too outspoken, or hard to get along with, or had an agenda. Facilitators were expected to get data from the stories of patients, and patients are given a template for how to tell stories. For example, they were to begin with a positive note, include some room for improvements, and end on a positive note. Employees, too, were expected to avoid unscripted emotions. They were to keep a united front, and they were not to air their dirty laundry. According to organizational communication theory, limiting interactions in this way decreases the chance that patients and employees will develop authentic, trusting relationships that deeply respect the other person's subjectivity and worldview, 
and that lead to organizational change. It steers the participants away from authenticity and moves the decision-making process away from the level of dynamic quality. So communication in the council meetings has the potential for dialogue, where organizational culture can be changed through mutual respect and authentic relationships. If the UAMS employees who influence the advisory council process are set on collecting data, then emotions and subjectivity will seem to them like noise, rather than an opportunity for developing a relationship. Effective employees will develop efficient ways to reduce that noise so they can collect the data they are incentivized to collect. Data collection, as a goal of communication, also clouds the fact that employees are people too, who have personal and emotional stories to share in dialogue with patients. In this sense, data seeking reduces the organization's appreciation for the importance of dynamic quality. Bringing patients, employees, and community members together as a council created the opportunity for people to get to know each other, but concerns about collecting data created barriers to dialogue. Another barrier to dialogue was that participants were discouraged from sharing emotions. Using this project's model in a practice-based way helped identify specific areas in local practice where dialogue was needed about the purpose of the council and their ideas about quality. It helped identify areas of the decision-making process that were not transparent, areas where the existing organizational structure got in the way of new relationships and of integrating silos, and where barriers to interpersonal communication exist. So here are some more specific recommendations for patient-centered advisory councils based on these findings. All of these recommendations are consistent with patient and family-centered care principles. Some of the unintended consequences for incentivizing the use of a standardized model of patient-centered care are that a whole new list of duties are created for some employees, a whole new department of experts are created for an organization, and sometimes conversations between patients and providers become scripted. Before establishing an advisory council, create opportunities for relationship building. Begin hosting events that encourage informal interactions between patients and staff in the community and on campus. A council should be as self-defined as possible, so when a council does begin to form, early meetings should encourage dialogue about why people have come to the meeting and what they expect to achieve. There should be few, if any, formal presentations from employees unless they are called for by the group in the course of their dialogue about the purpose of the group. Facilitators and council members should question all of their procedures and agenda items for how does this activity create or constrain dialogue? This is consistent with organizational communication theory, and there are tools, like liberating structures, for facilitating this kind of dialogue in groups. The council has to control how they are connected to UAMS. It can't be dependent on the existing organizational structure. It has to come from and be centered around interpersonal relationships, and particularly around those relationships between frontline employees and patients where static quality standards meet the source of dynamic quality. Their connection has to be flexible and mobile up and down the chain, so the council can have an influence on decision making at the level of their choosing. This is consistent with patient and family centered care principles. Council members and employees should expect that the decision making process be a major focus of the group. For all the decisions they weigh in on, they should expect to know who made the final decision and the rationale for that decision. The person who makes the decision should expect to attend a council meeting to discuss the decision in person, including why that person believed it was their responsibility to make the decision. The course of the council recommendations should be a recurring agenda item, and the council should decide when its issues are resolved or tabled. When a decision needs to be made, employees should always ask, can this decision be made by council members instead of the department they're advising? Not just giving them a chance to vote on options designed and provided by the employees, but, more importantly, giving them responsibility for deciding what is a problem. Experience in this project suggests that we can improve healthcare quality and public health by reconceptualizing them. Quality is best defined not as conformity to a standard, but as an ongoing process of adapting to a local environment. This is consistent with quality improvement literature but it's a challenge for experts in an expert-centered organizational culture. Patient-centered medical homes, coordinated care, and team-based care are meant to improve quality by engaging patients in their own care. But our purpose for using these models is important. Is it because we are trying to meet national standards or financial incentives 
or because these are the kinds of tools we need to strengthen our communities. Application of this model of dynamic quality in the practice of coordinated care can help identify specific areas where power and responsibility are not being moved towards people in communities, like this local example of a model of patient-centered care that has physicians in the driver's seat. This project's model builds on health literacy literature that suggests improving people's ability to read and understand medical advice is important but insufficient. It suggests that health literacy is the capacity of people in local communities to take responsibility for defining and meeting their own standards of health quality, which decreases the need for expert advice and for health systems. The application of this model of dynamic quality and the practice of health literacy improvement can help identify discrepancies in the way we conceptualize health literacy and provide opportunities to have dialogue about the purpose of our collaboration around health, like this clip from a council document suggesting the goal of providing education is to have cooperative patients. According to the NIH, the process of developing a novel drug, device, or other intervention can take about 14 years and $2 billion to develop, with a failure rate exceeding 95%. From the perspective of a community, that's a lot of time and money wasted. Application of this model of dynamic quality in practice-based research designs can help identify research problems that can be solved locally without using these expensive and time-consuming research systems. The research cycle can be shortened by moving the bench to the bedside, so to speak, by conceptualizing people as health practitioners. People in communities should be conceptualized as practitioners of health, and experts should be conceptualized as costly adjuncts. The model also suggests that public health is best conceptualized not as a goal to be achieved, but as a perspective that may be useful in solving local health problems. That way, communities first focus on solving their own problems in context, using the assets they have. In other words, we don't want people to practice a public health behavior because it's the right thing to do, or because it's the law, but because it makes sense to them in the context of their lives. Scientific models and theories are not right or wrong. They're useful or not, including the use of the model of dynamic quality presented today. This is not a model of how public health really works. It's a model that can be useful in working on the public health problems we face right now. Making decisions for people costs the people the opportunity to learn how to make decisions through practice and to apply solutions based on their own strengths and local assets. It also denies them the chance to turn problems into opportunities for creativity. 100% compliance to predefined solutions eliminates the chance to learn from positive deviants, people who have found a better way to do things. This points to the need for an organizational structure that facilitates distributive models of leadership, where leadership is situational, transient, and available to every member of an organization, and where decision-making is a collaborative and transparent process. The reflective practice approach used in this project highlighted areas where the process was most influenced by the traditional leadership approach of the organization's culture, that is, the areas where dialogue about purpose and change were most needed. Instead of dictating changes in these areas, we have to use our formal positions of authority in an organization to allow our employees to have more dialogue about values and purpose and to develop better relationships with each other across disciplines and departments and with their patients and with people in their communities. This brings the process of judging the usefulness and legitimacy of assumptions, theories, standards, and goals closer to the level of our relationship with patients and closer to the level of dynamic quality. The implications for leaders in science and public health, then, is that our primary objective is to serve the interests of communities and that we define their most valuable and indispensable interest as their freedom to engage in the local process of creating knowledge about health. These qualities of leadership are important not only because it theoretically makes our organizations more useful to the public, but also because it is essential to the life of the organization. With social media increasing access to information and increasing lateral communication channels, people in communities are being exposed to more and more information from more and more sources and will have to decide which sources they trust and which they don't. Organizations like universities and professional associations will not necessarily be considered primary sources of information or services in the future. Their relationships with the public will make a difference. So it's important for people in communities 
and members of health-related organizations to recognize that no particular system, organization, or concept is inherently essential to people and communities, and that we will have better health care organizations and better public health if people and communities are actively and meaningfully engaged in the process of determining the value of those organizations, adapting those organizations to meet the needs of their community, and rapidly but carefully deconstructing the organizations that do not meet their needs. Deconstructing organizations is difficult for members of the organization to do. It requires humility, openness, transparency, and self-reflection in practice. This project was a demonstration of how a model of dynamic quality can be a tool to help us reflect on our practice of designing programs and systems for health and public health. Using this tool, we can have a richer conversation and are more likely to have a dialogue that results in more and better options for approaching the public health priorities of the 21st century.